Welcome, everyone, to another episode of What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Regions. And today we've got another education-filled show. Several weeks ago, maybe it was a month ago now, I had Dr. Susan Hassig on the phone. She's an epidemiologist at Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. And when I saw the uh, COVID numbers beginning to spike again for our area, I reached out to her and asked her if she'd be willing to come back and address some of the issues that we're seeing. What I want to know specifically is what's changed? Why are things so much different now than they were a couple months ago? I felt like we had this in the rearview mirror for a little while, and now it's back in front of us. And seemingly, there is a lot more kids getting sick now, and I think that was just articulated in the previous news segment. So I've got Dr. Hassett coming up after the first break to talk to us about what's changed and what treatments may have changed and what we need to know, what behaviors she would suggest that may be new going forward. Now, I know there are plenty of you out there that still think this coronavirus, and maybe you're right, I'm not telling you wrong, is a hoax. And I'm going to ask her to address that as well as some of the other things. And I've printed out a list of the top 10 conspiracy theories involved with the coronavirus, everything being that 5G cell towers are causing the coronavirus to whatever you got. So we'll go through some of those. I've been speaking to her last time. She has a great sense of humor, and I think she'll enjoy bouncing around some of these crazy theories. I want to remind everybody of this upcoming event that we're having. I'm very, very proud of it and happy to see the enrollment numbers increasing. And that is on Wednesday, July 15th at noon. I'm going to have Mark Sanborn on the show. Mark is an author, sold a couple million books, his most famous being one called The Fred Factor. And we're going to focus on the four most important changes you need to make right now as it relates to the workplace and the workforce. Mark's background and expertise is in leadership and customer service. And what he's going to take us through is what his research is showing will be the new norm. We hear that a lot. Will be the new norm going forward. Uh, as a result of the coronavirus, COVID-13, 15, 19, whatever it's called. So Mark's going to lead us through this webinar July 15th at noon, and I hope you'll get involved. What we've done to try to create it more as an event is tie in a couple of local pizza companies. And if you register for the event, you're going to get two discount codes, one for Mellow Mushroom and one for Marco's Pizza. Mellow Mushroom, 25% off. Marco's Pizza, 30% off for delivery to your office. And you can pull the team together, sit around the conference room table, sit around the warehouse, wherever it may be, and listen to where Mark's expertise is telling us things will be in the future. And then most importantly, what do you and I need to do to make sure our customers and our teams are well taken care of going forward. Again, that's July 15th at noon. If you want more information about it, you can go to whatsworkingcam.com. Again, whatsworkingcam.com, where you will find that registration information, or you can text what's working to the number 44222. What's working to 44222. We are promoting this thing, as you may imagine, on social media right now. Look for us on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, and LinkedIn. We now have a pretty good presence on LinkedIn, both me personally as well as the What's Working show. Earlier, I guess it was last week actually, I interviewed a couple of ladies from M2 Solutions, Beth Morzett and Andrea Moore. They're a female business in a male-dominated industry. And they are being featured tomorrow night on the 6 p.m. show where we do the deep dive into what's going on out there with these different businesses, where we dig deep looking for the trends. And it's fun. These two ladies are both blonde, and they're the ones teasing themselves when they told me this. Two blondes walk into a concrete convention. Sounds like a joke. It's not. What they do is sell products that are, for example, additives to concrete that will make they stretch the life of concrete another 70 years. Additives to paint that stretch the lives of, of paint for years. Waterproofing that, sets, that stretches the lives of the product that it goes on. And if you want to learn a little bit about their business and how two females have broken into a traditionally male-dominated industry, I want you to find that podcast, which will be aired tomorrow night. It will be broadcast tomorrow night. But the podcast can be heard right now at whatsworkingcam.com. Again, M2 Solutions, Beth Morzette and Andrea Moore. uh, Really, really interesting stuff. Looking still for ideas from you on Take It or Leave It. I'll remind you what that is. What are you going to bring with you as a result of our current uh, environment that you're going to take as a part of your business going forward? What are you taking? Is it something that one of my guests may have said in the past? Is it something you've stumbled on? What are you going to own of the process of COVID-19 that will become a part of your business going forward? And secondly, what are you going to leave behind? 
What are you looking forward to never seeing again as a result of this process? For me right now, it's masks and it's the lack of my phone ringing. There's a part of that that has something to do with it. So take it or leave it. Let me know what you think. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. It's brought to you by Regions. When we come back, Dr. Susan Hassig at Tulane University School of Public Medicine. Dr. Susan Hassig is on the line with me. She's a faculty member of the Epidemiology Department at Tulane University School of uh, Public Health and Tropical Medicine since 1996. More than a decade of work in HIV research, surveillance, and intervention programs in the U.S. and around the globe. She was a guest of our shows a couple months ago, and we have her back now that this coronavirus, COVID-19 thing seems to be rearing its head again. Dr. Hassig, thank you so much for your willingness to come back on the show. Happy to be here with you, Cam. So you were very helpful and entertaining and fun to talk to the last time we were on the phone, and it's uh, glad to have you back. And what I want to, I've got, like I said, I got about five pages of content here that I want to run past you. We're going to have a hard time getting through to it, but I'd like you to start. What's going on with the coronavirus out there? Why does it feel like it's rearing its ugly head in even a worse way than it did the first time? Well, because it is. Um, <laughs> The problem with our perception, I think, collectively, is that, you know, it was really bad in New York and, frankly, in New Orleans. And everybody else in the country was kind of eh, a little bit worried, but not too much. And it was mostly New York City and New Jersey. And so when it went down there and when it went down in New Orleans, everybody kind of said, "Okay, good, it's over. But it wasn't. And so the reality is that this virus probably moved into different parts of the country in slightly different timelines. And so it's been gradually building up a, an infection uh, pattern in a lot of communities that has gone largely unrecognized. And now we're starting to see it present itself what is because that? we're looking for it. And so we know that it's there now and it's showing up in hospitalization, which is what is most problematic. All right. There's a couple, um, couple things. I, I hate to interrupt you, but a couple of things I want to get clear on in my head as we go forward. It was showing up and it was unrecognized. What does that mean? Well, it, it was present. I mean, one of the things about this virus and, and many other diseases is that um, they can be present in a population, in individuals in a population, without people realizing that they are infected or that they might possibly be spreading it. It's what, you know, in scientific, we talk about asymptomatic spread. And so you can be infected, not realize it, go about your business, and as you talk and communicate and hang out with friends and whatever, you're shedding the virus. Some of them pick it up. They may not get sick either. They go on to spread it to other people. And that happens with this virus, we believe, really quite frequently and to a fairly substantial degree. But eventually, people who have some of those underlying conditions, we've all heard about the hypertension, the diabetes, get infected. And then they get sick. And then we realize, oh, it's here. I mean, New Orleans didn't recognize we had an infection problem until somebody showed up at the emergency room in acute respiratory distress. That's when we found our first case. It wasn't because we were looking for it. And so it has, the virus has been in the United States, some scientists believe, since December. Yeah. Kind of just percolating through the population, not causing a lot of problems, but sometimes causing problems that didn't get recognized. It was assumed to be influenza or it was assumed to be something else. And, but now we've got tests that we're using, and so now we're able to identify and name it and, that, and point to it. And uh, the reality is, is we're probably still not finding the majority of people who are infected because there are potentially so many more people that are carrying the virus that may never think about presenting themselves to be tested and may never get sick. You mentioned in your opening comment uh, something about hospitalizations, which is mostly concerning. Tell me more about that. Well, the problem with hospitalization is that we have only a finite amount of health care that we have available at any given point in time because we have to have physical space and we have to have people to man that or person that 
physical space, nurses, doctors, respiratory technicians, x-ray people, you know, hospital cleaning staff, the food service, all of that goes into providing health care. Um, and as coronavirus cases increase, when they get sick, they get pretty sick, mostly. They wind up being in the hospital for very long periods of time, two, three weeks sometimes. Um, and so they take up that hospital space that we have available to us. And that means that if there are too many, a lot of coronavirus patients, then people who have other health problems aren't going to be able to get health care because there aren't beds and people to take care of them. So you're going to have to, as we did at, at one point in New York and in New Orleans, for sure, we put, you know, every elective procedure in medicine got put off until things settled down. And so there are places around the country right now, Houston, I believe, and uh, Phoenix, I think as well, they are, you know, they have no more space in their healthcare systems. They're having to find other ways to provide care for people. This, and that's a problem for coronavirus patients as well as for everybody else that's got a health problem. So this was the original reason for implementing yes. social distancing, wasn't it? To yes, prevent it the overflow of the hospital. Curve. Yeah, to flatten the curve, exactly, flatten the curve. And that's exactly what we're seeing going on again right now. However, uh, the social distancing protocols have been weakened, if not eliminated in some places, it seems. is right. uh, and, and so you're predicting, if I can deduce here, you're predicting the bigger spike. Yeah, because it's going to be involving many more communities and ultimately more people. Um, and just because we flattened the curve once doesn't mean it stays flat. You know, we flattened the curve in New York, we flattened the curve in New Orleans and a few other locations where the virus hit early. But now, you know, we're looking at Houston and Phoenix and Los Angeles and Atlanta and, you know, states on a whole. There are different places in Louisiana now that are having much bigger problems than they ever had in March and April. I want to ask you and about... I'm sorry, doc, please go no, ahead. that's okay. Go ahead. I want to ask you about some of the headlines that I'm seeing, or, or at least the, I feel like this is the case this time, and I can't point to data, but I, per, perhaps you can clarify this. The kids, the youth are more vulnerable, it seems, this time. Is that, uh, is that me imagining things, or is that well, true? Well, part of what you have to remember, it's not that they're more vulnerable, but we are, first of all, we're looking for coronavirus cases differently than we did back in March. Back in March, remember when we didn't have enough tests to go around, we were basically only testing people that were sick. So that means when we found those people, they were more likely to be older. It doesn't mean that 18 to 29-year-olds weren't infected, but they just weren't showing up in the emergency rooms to be available to be tested. You'll remember you had to be symptomatic to get a coronavirus test for a really long time, almost everywhere in the country. Then testing became more available, and that kind of coincided with the reopening in a lot of places, most of which probably shouldn't have reopened as much or when they did. And so then with testing more available, a lot of places relaxed. You didn't have to be sick. You didn't have to be in an emergency room to get tested. And so then they decide, you know, they people, almost anyone could walk up and get a test, you know, if there was a community testing place around. So we're finding young people who are um, out engaging in working in the economy, perhaps working in the reopened coffee shops, working in the reopened bars or patronizing the bars, the restaurants. And so they're out interacting with people. And so they are at infected. And now we're, the way we're testing, we're finding them. Let me ask so, you. So, you know, I think a lot of people who are perceiving themselves as being vulnerable for serious outcomes probably aren't the people that are going out to the bars on Friday and Saturday nights. They're probably staying at home with, you know, a streaming service of some kind. Yeah. There's a, a, a chart that I printed out prior to coming to the studio, put it out by the Texas Medical Association. It's know your risk during COVID-19, and it rates behaviors between number one, which is low risk, and number nine, very high risk. Uh -huh. And the highest high risk item is going to a bar. What, happen, what happens 
Now, I have to say, I've been to some bars, and there are some of them that are undoubtedly unhealthy, many of them in New Orleans, where you go in and go, I hope to come out of here. Um, but what is it about a bar that makes it more vulnerable than, and this, this you see a lot on social media if you dare go there, uh, people can protest the Black Lives Matter and there's no fear of coronavirus, but go hang out at a bar? That's not appropriate. Tell me what the difference in the two are. Well, what I will say is that I've seen that graphic. Yeah. And oh, okay. I don't disagree in general with kind of the gradation, but what you have to realize is that you can have a safe bar, but it means that every patron in the bar has to be six feet away from every other patron in the bar that isn't part of their group. So, you know, you could go with your best buddy and sit at a table and have your drinks, and there could be another table of two more people who you might think are kind of cute or really attractive and might like to get to know, but you don't interact with them closer than six feet, and hopefully you're wearing a mask when you're not drinking your drinking your drink. Right. So that kind of bar would probably not be a nine. It would be a three or four, but it might not have a lot of business. Right. right. <laughs> so so the, the reality is that, you know, a, a particular type of activity has some inherent level of risk because, you know, in bars, alcohol, we all know, influences our decision-making processes. And so you may go into the bar intending to keep your mask on and, and keeping physically distant, but you're in a bar. People are having fun. You're, you know, playing Trivial Pursuit or you're watching some kind of historic sporting event right. on the television and you're cheering for your team or whatever the case may be. They are environments where people gather generally in fairly close quarters to get to see and interact with other people. And so that's problematic. You know, in church, it's, it's kind of, it's a different kind of congregating, generally far more sedate. But in fact, if a church environment, if a religious service environment is overcrowded, if people are too close to one another, if there's a lot of fervent religious singing and, and everything else going on, and people aren't masked, that could also be a very risky environment. So part of it is kind of what draws people to that place, what kind of their expectations are, but it's ultimately how people interact in that environment that makes it risky. So let's go into a lot of the protests that we've been seeing mm -hmm. recently. Sure. So I'll try to spell out the way I see it on TV, and that mm -hmm. is people shoulder to shoulder, marching together, chanting, mm -hmm. and one of the questions that I want to ask you about is the uh, aerosol, the airborne um, micron droplet scenario. Right. Uh, but they're shoulder to shoulder, they're walking together, they're in close proximity, they're chanting, but this doesn't seem to be a spreading type environment. Am I misinterpreting that or am I right? Well, I, I think, you know, it's we have certainly looked to see whether that was a component of case development in New Orleans. And and we have not seen many people testing positive that engaged in protests. Now, they may not have chosen to get tested. So, you know, that's part of what you have to think about. But, I mean, the protests by large happened outside. And that's not a, a universally protective environment, but it does provide a much broader volume of air in which any kind of particle would be suspended. And so that is one piece working perhaps in favor of not seeing a huge impact from protests. Did people get infected at protests? I suspect they did. But it doesn't appear, at least in the particular areas, and I think it is an area city by city, community by community kind of function. We haven't seen that here in New Orleans. I don't know enough about data specific to Mobile to know whether the city or state health department thinks the protests contributed to um, that, to any increase in cases in, in your particular area. But here in New Orleans, for example, a lot of the protesters were wearing masks. Yeah. And, you know, masks will contain and block a lot of aerosols and a lot of droplets. So it's, you know, it's one of these things where it's, it's not usually just one thing that is going to um, prevent spread or, or promote spread, but it's often multiple things all working together. And if you're kind of 
on the bad side is the, the, the good or bad coin for a bunch of them, your risk is going to be much higher. Is it safe to say that we should, in the future, hold all protests in bars? <laughs> well, it depends on whether you want people to survive the protests or well, it not, seems, I guess. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the protest... I think that, you know, it's, it is a, um, a real problematic kind of scenario because I think large gatherings have the potential... Um, whether they are indoor or out, of potentially allowing many, many people to become infected in a relatively short period of time. We have not seen evidence of that with the outdoor protests, but any kind of large indoor gathering is something that we would be concerned about. So a large church environment, it's it's one of the, the real concerns and why many public health agencies have encouraged religious leaders to, as they move to in-person services, yeah. to be mindful of distancing and and the density of people in the congregate setting. We're seeing that we here. Dr. Hessick, we're going to go to break, and when we come back, I want to talk to you about the aerosol argument that I've been catching up on. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Regions. Dr. Susan Hassig is a faculty member of the Epidemiology Department since 1996 at Tulane University School of Tropical or Public Health and Tropical Medicine. She's back on the phone with us. She was with us about a month or so ago talking about corona and the, uh, the, the whole ep- uh, debacle, the whole episode, the whole kit and caboodle. Dr. Hassig, let's start with the aerosol question. I, I've seen this debated. It looks like it's a, it's a us versus them conversation with some of the uh, medical community. Uh, are aerosols key? Are they not key? Give us the scoop on that. Well, the reality is, Cam, that we're not entirely sure. Um, we know that they are part of the picture, and the the recognition that aerosols could be generated carrying coronavirus has been recognized for probably two or three months, which is like five years in corona time in science. Um but mostly the concern about aerosols were in the context of healthcare, where, you know, when, you know, we hear about people being intubated all the time. When you do that, it generates sprays and aerosols of particles, everything else that are very problematic for healthcare workers and often how healthcare workers become exposed to coronavirus. But seeing them and thinking about them in the context of the broader community has only really started to emerge as we have gotten the opportunity to examine some very specific kinds of transmission events. And these relate to, in some cases, office settings. There was an investigation of a call center in South Korea where they found that the individuals in the call center who were in, you know, banks of tables, you know, in an open room were uh, that they had many people become infected. And um, springing from a single individual that was in one place in the room. And that all of those people that got infected weren't within six feet of that person for it to be droplets. And so they, you know, they explored, they figured it out, they started modeling it in, you know, in a simulated environment. And they found that coronavirus could be, in fact, dispersed in very, very tiny droplets that we call aerosols. And those don't fall to the ground like the big droplets do. That's the six-foot rule. But they float. They float in air currents from air conditioning. They float, you know, and especially in an enclosed indoor space, they can stay suspended for a couple of hours. And so that's the – you may have also heard about the choir practice where almost everybody got infected from one person, they believe, who was initially infected. They believe that, too, was an aerosol spread kind of situation. When you sing, you project very forcefully. And, you you know, the droplets are heavy. They still fall at at about 60. But the aerosols were being suspended in the room. It was an enclosed room. They were there for a couple of hours. And even though they were spread physically apart, almost everybody got infected. So the problem is... Okay, okay, keep going. 
So, so that's why we're talking about aerosols more now. We have finally gotten an opportunity to analyze some of these events. The problem is we don't yet have a clear sense of just how important they are in terms of pushing the infection process forward. And so we don't know if it's only 5% of infections that are caused by aerosol exposure or if it's 35 or 55. And that's what people are really trying to figure out. Um, But it's hard because we don't always know who's infected. People that are identified as infected don't always know or can figure out where they might have been exposed. So it is really very, very challenging to try and determine the contribution of aerosols, but it's something we need to think about. And it's one of the reasons masking is so important. Well, that's the question that I had. If this aerosols prove to be uh, spreaders, like you suggest they could be, then the implications are the ventilation in the buildings, the the filters in the buildings need to be tightened up. If these things are as small as you suggest, UV lights in in places to kill the aerosols. And I'm wondering if they're... The other thing, too, is is air exchange, Cam. Um, Not keeping buildings so tight that it's just the same air recirculating over and over again, but just as outside helps to dilute, you know, virus particles because it's such a big mass of air, the more external air you work in through the HVAC system into a, a closed environment, the, the better it is as well because it's, it's helping to dilute those particles. So I'm holding in my hand a mask that I walked into the studio with. Is there the uh-huh. potential one of these days for there to be a minimum type of mask based on the, the ability to filter such that you say, yeah, you got a mask, but that's just a, you know, it's a, it's a shirt that's been sewn. It's a t-shirt that's been sewn into a mask for this to be effective. You're now going to have to have a mask with a minimum of something. I don't know what the measurement would be. um, In a perfect world, maybe. Um, But we are nowhere near perfect right now, Cam. We do not, we are with the, the expanded caseload right now. We're once again, concerned about N95 masks for healthcare workers. Yeah. And whether there are enough. The, the bottom line is any kind of facial covering, um, as rudimentary as it is, is going to reduce droplets as well as aerosols to varying degrees. So it's, you know, it's kind of like before coronavirus, what did, what did we talk about if you had a sneeze or a cough coming? You know, cough into your elbow or use a, clean, a, a tissue, a disposable tissue. Well, that disposable tissue isn't going to stop everything, but it's going to stop most things. Yeah. And so the idea in, in this environment and this reality that we're living in right now is we've got a number of things that will combined greatly reduce the likelihood of infection being spread, and it's really important that we engage in all of them because none of them is perfect. And we don't really have the opportunity for perfect right now. So I've got a handful of questions here uh, Mm -hmm. that I want to ask you to make a prediction. I also have the top (laughs) conspiracy theories for COVID. And I'm going to ask you, which direction do you want to go? One of them is serious. One of them (laughs) is serious only to certain people. Um, let's do some conspiracy theories first, and then maybe do a few of the other more serious ones. 5G cell signals are to blame for coronavirus. Absolutely not. That's it. That's I, I love that brief no. answer. I love the brevity. Thank you so much for that. This is a virus. Okay. It's not radiation or anything. Now, now the, none of these are intended to offend you, doctor. No, no, They're, I know, I know. It's just, I, it just, it just never dies. COVID nineteen doesn't really exist. Oh, it definitely exists. Yeah, all right. Big Pharma created COVID-19 to sell more shares. No, (laughs) they're not that smart. (laughs) I love that answer. Number four, the elites have created the COVID-19 virus to cull the human population so they can have more stuff for themselves. (laughs) Again, they're not that smart. Oh, I love it. I love it. Here's number five. Aliens created the COVID-19 virus. No, Mother Nature did. And the last one, I had to stop. Well, I got two more here. Uh, The upcoming vaccines will be designed to sterilize us. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness, no. 
I, I, I hope I'm. Not. I hope I'm a light moment to your day. I hope these you are. You are. You are. And finally, the Which COVID. Is why I don't go on social media. Very yes, much. you shouldn't. I do, and I do, and my mind runs away. Okay. Uh, final uh, conspiracy theory: the COVID death rates are inflated. If you get struck by lightning today, they're going to say it was COVID that did it. No, actually, we're being relatively restrictive. Even people that we think might have died of coronavirus are not being counted. Oh, interesting. That is that is that is absolutely askew to what so many people are saying out there. Mm-hmm. But let's not get into that. Here's what I want to yeah. ask you on a more serious tone. Play this out for me, Dr. Hassig. Where do we go? Give me give me your six month projection. Give me your one year projection. Give me your five year projection. What do you see happening? Well, I don't think a vaccine is going to be available until well into twenty twenty one. So in order to get from now till then, um, it's, re- it's only going to continue to spread if people don't listen and do the things that we know will have at least some impact on transmission. And so I would, look, I would have people look at what has happened in New Orleans, which is an environment I'm very familiar with. Our mayor put a mask mask before we opened up. He opened up very cautiously, very conservatively, and we have some of the lowest case burden in the state of Louisiana. Next door to us, Jefferson Parish didn't have a mask mandate. The the parish president, our county leader here uh, in Louisiana, put a mask mandate on last week because the numbers were two to three times higher in Jefferson Parish than they were in Orleans Parish. Um, And so... The, the virus is not going to stop unless we stop it. And we stop it by wearing masks and staying physically distant. But we also need to keep our economy going. And the best way to keep our economy going is to have people feel safe and legitimately be safe engaging in the economy. And the way that you do that is just being aware of your surroundings, not being up on somebody in a grocery line and wearing a mask. Then we can do a lot of things and not have this get out of control. It's going to be really hard for Florida and Texas and Arizona and California, particularly Los Angeles, to get their infection burden under control without doing some fairly drastic movement restriction and possible business restrictions. Um, And I think that we all need to pay attention to that and recognize that. And even New York City, um, you know, it can bounce back there, just as it it is starting to bounce back in some places around Louisiana. Um, So this virus isn't going to quit. And so we've got to take actions to allow us to, you know, function in a semi-normal way, um, get our kids back to school, you know, open up workplaces so that people can, you know, feel good about earning an, an income again and um, and do that while we hopefully have one of these early vaccine candidates hit the jackpot and, and wind up being a solution for us. Dr. Hessig, we have just uh, 30, 40 seconds prior to the next break, and then we'll get into a little bit more prior to closing the show. But you mentioned a virus until 2021. When the I'm sorry, uh, uh, a vaccine in 2021. When the vaccine comes out, is it an off switch? Is this all no. over? No. Well, first of all, you have to recognize not everybody's going to get the vaccine on the first day it's available. Yeah. That's just not going to happen. So it's, it's complicated, and it may be a vaccine that you need two doses for it really to be protective. Yeah. So it's, it is, we don't know yet because we don't have it. Well, let's talk about the vaccine and what that may look like when we come back from break. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. On the line, Dr. Susan Hasick from Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. We'll be back after this break. Going to finish off the conversation with Dr. Susan Hasek here. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Regions. And Dr. Hasek, at 1.52 p.m. on this show, we recap the 
the biggest points made in the show. I want to make sure anybody that couldn't stay for the entire show gets what we feel are the biggest points to note. And today I've got my top line prime note taker, my favorite oldest daughter here next to me taking notes for me. Here they are, the six things that we're coming away with. We're probably still not finding the majority of the COVID viruses out there. The hospitalizations are still the issue that we're going to run out of space in the hospital and too many people get too sick and there's suddenly no room for other people that need help. Uh, The youth are not more vulnerable, but we are looking for symptoms and they are now there are more tests available now and those youth are continuing to interact with people as they come out of their quarantine state and that's why we're seeing perhaps this spike in the youth protests are have a, the protesters that have been a popular part of our society in the past i don't know 3 4 weeks bigger volume of air for the disease to be airborne not as many people in a, a, a tight space which has allowed the virus apparently to spread less commonly during the protests aerosols aerosols is with an a sweetheart aerosols uh concerns in healthcare. they float on the air currents they can stay in the air for hours and any face covering will help greatly any face covering dr hasick just prior to the break we were talking a little bit about vaccines it's not an off switch there's going to be a process and we don't even know what it's going to look like because we don't have a vaccine let's finish on that conversation of hope and what a vaccine might can do for us well a vaccine and it's developed, and I think one will be. We just don't know for sure <laughs> that it will be one of the four that seem to be the, the front runners right now. What it will allow us to do is to hopefully build protection for ourselves and collectively for the whole community against this virus. And then the virus won't be able to infect anybody. It won't be able to, to expand its range. It will die off. Um, but the, the challenge that we have with vaccines is it's a really complicated biologic process. And we have to take the time to test and make sure that the vaccine does what we think it does and doesn't cause problems that we don't want it to cause. And so I'm afraid that the, the progress that we are making in vaccines it's going to slow down a little bit because we have to test it. We have to test it in real people who have to get the vaccine and then potentially be exposed to see whether the vaccine actually does protect them. We don't know that yet for any of these four vaccines, whether the four that have gotten off so much publicity really will protect people yet. That's the big question. And once we figure that out, and that could take months, under normal conditions, that would take years, but we're in an emergency, and so they've, they've looked at recruiting more people so they can get answers potentially faster, but it's still a process that's going to take a long time, and then if, in fact, the vaccine does work, the real problem for me is that we're testing it in young, healthy people because that's who it's safest to test it in, but in fact, the people that we are really most concerned about are older people who aren't necessarily so healthy. And so we may also have to do some other testing to see whether the vaccine is also safe and effective in older people before it winds up rolling out completely to the population. So it's a, it's a, the development of vaccines is an incredible, valuable tool for public health and for preventing illness, but it's not something that happens overnight. I remember reading that the development of a vaccine in the amount of time that we're asking for would be equivalent to U.S. putting the man on the moon in the same amount of time. It was a Mm 10-year process since Kennedy said we're going to put a man on the moon, and we're asking for the same heavy lift in two years or less than two years. Is that about right? That's about right. I mean, it took over eight years for the polio vaccine to be developed, and that was an urgent crisis in the 50s. I mean... It was a, a terrifying disease, and it was that's you know it was an incredibly fast vaccine development process. We've been fortunate in some ways that this virus is somewhat closely related to some other viruses that we've had experience with, and so some of the candidates for the vaccine they're taking work that they had started with the previous SARS virus, but then never pursued fully because we never saw that virus come back. Uh, But they've 
taken that work up again and kind of jump-started their work on the COVID-19 vaccine by using that information and that, that knowledge um, to try and, and make things move quicker. But, <clears throat> excuse me, I cannot tell you just how unusual it is to have learned so much so quickly about this virus and to be in a position to be testing a vaccine candidate this quickly yeah. is, has never been done before. Dr. Susan Hasek, faculty member, Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, a great uh, ally of ours in the show and spreading the information. Folks, if you know somebody that needs to hear this content that is caught up, particularly in the conspiracy theories, you can find the show at whatsworkingcam.com about one hour from now. Dr. Hassig, thank you so much for your time. We'll have you back again to get an update. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Regents.